question today to each and every one of us. What is revival? Because many of us have an understanding as revival as being something that we hear advertised. Come to a revival meeting. Come to a re series of revival meetings on a particular day at a particular place. Or some of us may say there's a revival conference or there's a revival church. But do we truly understand what revival is? <laughs> Many of us have not truly seen revival. I've been blessed to be able to go to Kenya and see revival, the end time revival that is happening across this earth right now and has started within that place. I've seen it. I've seen the demonstration of the fruits. But as I study revival, as I look towards the past of what God has done, and I'm not just talking about moves of God, I'm talking about genuine revival. So what is revival? <laughs> revival is when a community becomes aware of and conscious about the move of God itself. And it will always start with the people of that particular area. So if revival was to break out here, it would immediately affect those next door. It would immediately affect those at the park and those around this particular area. See, revival is when God himself comes on the scene and the people are aware of God coming on the scene. Hallelujah. So it's not a matter of days. It's not something when revival comes. It's not a matter of months or a matter of days. It's something that happens within a matter of hours where God comes on the scene and within a matter of hours, things start to happen. Things start to change. Hallelujah. In revival, when it starts within a matter of hours, men and women will start to cry out, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, Lord, because I am a sinner. And what will start to happen is that God literally steps down from heaven on that particular day, at that particular minute, at that particular second, and something changes within the atmosphere. And that is what we want to see today, not only in the church, but also in the community. Hallelujah. And God is saying, revival is not about a man of God. It's not about a particular evangelist. It's not about this particular person or that person. God and revival, genuine revival, is when God himself chooses to come down and create an atmosphere of worship that is attracted to Him, that He will come and dwell and tabernacle Himself within the church of that hour. Hallelujah. So, as we become aware of this, the understanding, have we experienced it? Well, I don't believe we experience it to the level within this city at all. But I believe through those that are hungry and thirsty, as I was saying before, through the book of Isaiah. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, from chapter 44, verse 3, For I will pour out water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit upon your city, and my blessings will come also upon you. Are we that thirsty for this move of God? Are we so thirsty to see revival in our places? Well, when revival comes, it must come to vessels that have made their hearts clean and their hearts pure and their hands clean and pure also. Because the Bible tells us in Psalm 24, verses 3 to 5, Who may ascend in the hill of the Lord, who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of that hour. Hallelujah! How thirsty are we? Have we made our heart so pure? Have we lifted up our soul to another idol? Has something come a priority over God and wanting to be with God and be in His presence? Hallelujah. 
But that is what God is looking within this hour. He's looking for a people that will raise up and want more of Him. Hallelujah. See, programs are good and I'm not rock knocking those programs because I've been part of programs all my ministry life. But what I'm saying is there's something more than programs. There's something more than these little things. There is something when God steps on the scene, it creates an awareness of God that everyone around will cry out to God and say, God, I need help. I spoke to you last week about Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus stepped onto Gandora, the shore of Gandora, where the man that was possessed with a legion of demons of 5,000 came running to him kilometers away where there was an awareness of God on that island within that hour as soon as Jesus stepped on that shore. And it created a clear mind that all those things that were possessing him had to release him that he could run to Jesus in that hour. Hallelujah. There was an awareness of God, meaning God the Father stepped on that ground that day and created a change and brought a change within that young man's life from that day never to be the same. Hallelujah. See, when revival comes, pure revival, when it happened in New Heaven is, all of a sudden, within the matter of minutes and hours, things would change through a small group of people that were starting to pray. And one young man stepped up and said, we've been praying here every Friday and every Tuesday, all night prayers. And we've listened to the two old ladies of 80 years of age that were deep intercessors. But he said, there is something wrong. We are praying for this thing. But God is telling me we ourselves have got unclean hearts. We have got idols before Him and we must repent before Him. It was such a deep repentance. These weren't just your average Christians. They were mature people that were dedicated for two to three months of praying every Tuesday and Friday. All night prayers. And the two old ladies at 80 years of age they would get on their knees and they said, we will make a promise. If you do this, we will get on our knees from 10 o'clock that night to 4 o'clock in the morning. 80 years of age. That would put us all to shame if we were to hear what took place with those old ladies. But something happened when he mentioned those words. He just fell on his knees and he started weeping. He knew how wretched he was before God. And the elders of that church that were there in that meeting, they fell down into a trance. And from that very second, something changed within the whole area of that place called Lewis. The move of God came. All of a sudden, young people started to gather together because they were convicted by this sin. When true revival comes, people will just start to gather together to talk about their experiences that they also are having from the conviction and the awareness of God. Hallelujah. Have we seen such a level in this place, in this nation? I do not believe to the level that God wants to bring here to fulfill His end time prophecy of His greatest outpouring of His Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Could Jesus come tomorrow? Yes, He could come. But my hope and my faith is believing that God is going to do something within this place. Hallelujah. So it is when God comes along and He grips people and brings them and drives people to come to church. Hallelujah. Imagine one day this place was full with people from this whole area. Never seen those people before. But they, when they walked past this place, they could hear the worship the weeks before. They knew something of God was taking place in that place. They knew the tracks you distributed before had come from a certain place or a destiny. And they wanted to get hold of that place. 
They wanted to come and get filled because they knew there was something dry in them. When God grips you, you know you have an awareness of God. You know that God is the only thing that can fill that deep earning within your soul that you need God to come and fill you up. Hallelujah. There were two characteristics that followed those deep revivals. One was that there was an awareness of God like never before within the whole community. And number two, there was no backsliding. Every single person that got saved from that time never backslided. They continued praying most of just all of their lives from that point on. When taverns and pubs closed down, they never reopened. They never reopened because the move of God would come into that place. People would be in dances and they would shut down because a move of God would start. Because some young man would be praying in that hall. Bang, the presence of God would come. Then they would run, flee for their lives and go straight to the church. Come to the front altar and give their lives to Christ. Hallelujah. So what do we need to do? What do we need to do to pursue this cloud? To pursue this cloud of glory. The glory that came in the Old Testament. The glory that came in the New Testament. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory cloud came. And the glory cloud also came when we are in the meeting in Kasumu. The same glory, the same manifestation of the Father's glory had come down. But we must pursue this thing. So today I want to talk about those patriarchs from the Old Testament. And today I'm going to use the character of Moses. Because there is a lot of evidence written about Moses that we can discuss his life, discuss his story. And look at the evidence that we will see. And look at the 1,500 year pursuit of God's glory. That's right, 1,500 years. This man pursued God's glory. See, he realized the importance was not just to pursue God for his own sake or his own gain. It is because God's, God's greatest desire and delight is that we ourselves pursue Him. Hallelujah. The burning desire to see God's glory. Do you have a burning desire in your heart to see God's glory as Moses did? Hallelujah. That is a question we must ask ourselves. To see Him face to face in one of the most important times ever to live on the face of this earth is to keep our oils full, to keep it full for the return of the Lord and the imminent rapture of the bride. But do we desire to seek after Him like Moses did? Well, we will discuss those today. Because when Moses told God, He said, show me your glory. The Lord said, you can't see Moses. Let's have a look at that. So from Exodus 33. From verses 18 to 23. It says, and he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand in the cleft of the rock. So it shall be while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hands while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see the back of my face. And shall you not have seen? You will know that you've seen the glory of God. Hallelujah! So imagine this. 
Moses, fortunately, did not stop there. He didn't say, well, that was enough. I've just had an encounter with God. He said, just as he did not stop there, I believe that the church has stopped. Where they are just content with the things that have taken place in the past. When they should be like Moses that is seeking after God, even beyond the barriers of what God had placed before him. Because we see here that, and he said, please show me your glory. And then he said, I will take all my goodness and pass before you. It would have been easier for Moses to be satisfied with God's first answer. But he wasn't. Moses wasn't selfish or he wasn't presumptuous or he wasn't, he wasn't um, uh, rude in any ways. He wasn't seeking material things. He wasn't seeking personal fame or favour. He was, wasn't seeking miracles. He wasn't seeking spiritual gifts. The greatest gift and blessing we can ever give Him is to come after God and to pursue Him and to seek Him. Hallelujah. Yet still Moses pursued Him even while he was talking with the Lord. The Israelites even turned their back from God and they ran from God. So when he asked them to draw near on the Mount of Sinai, they even turned their backs. But it was Moses who boldly pressed into the cloud of his presence. Moses often walked into the unsealing cloud of his Shachani glory or into the place of the tent of meeting. And somehow he dared to desire even more than what he was encountering. Imagine the encounters Moses was having was happening to him. But he understood that it was good to have God go with you. And that's why he says, God, I will not go anywhere unless your presence goes with me. Hallelujah. But that it was better to go with God than to be without God. Hallelujah. So Moses wanted something deeper. It says here, he wanted God that desperately. See, he wanted to become a habitation of God, not just a visitation. He had many visitations of God, but he himself wanted that God to become a habitation in his life. Hallelujah. So the Israelites rarely took time to thank God for his mighty acts that he did throughout that era, as we know, because they were too busy with their shopping lists. They were too busy with their complaints to God. And that is the same thing with the church today. When we come to church on a Sunday, we're normally coming to Him with our shopping list. We're normally coming to Him with our complaints, just like the Israelites. Turning our backs from God even when God doesn't answer those things on our shopping list. But Moses knew there was something more. He knew the price that needed to be paid. He knew the desire that he had in his heart to seek those things of God. Hallelujah. The vast majority in the church, they have all done the same things as those Israelites. So any more than any person alive, at that time, Moses had even experienced the manifest presence of God in such a measure that no one had encountered before. But he longed for more than a visitation. His locked soul started to long for a habitation of God. Hallelujah. He had gone beyond fear and he had gone beyond that fear of what God told him he couldn't do. And he now stepped over the line into love. We know the Bible says perfect love will cast out all fear. And the Bible says, yes, we must fear him while we are alive. But when he calls us home, that is when we have the confidence we can then step to him in love. Hallelujah. We need to go deeper. We need to go deeper than ever before. So he wanted to see God's face, even though it seemed like an impossible mission and an impossible task to see his face. Moses somehow sensed there was a way 
a hungry person will always try to find a way. Hallelujah. And he had been ignited in his being that would drive him to the risk of death in God's presence to achieve the satisfaction of the thirst of his soul to become a habitation. That hunger was destined to spare not only for his life on this earth, but for another 1,500 years in total until we start to read that account that took place, that was fulfilled, not in the Old Testament, but that many years later in the New Testament. Hallelujah. So Moses has his mighty encounter. The hunger in Moses' his heart birthed a prayer and a persistence that defined the limits of time and space. It defined the, the logics and the law of, of all things of this universe. And it went beyond. It's as though his prayer was just constantly in the ear of God, in the ear of God, in the ear of God, in the ear of God. The conclusion to the story is that when we jump ahead those 1,500 years, we see what took place on that Mount of Transfiguration and we turn to Luke 9, chapter 9, verses 8. 28 to 33. It says, Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke in his de decrees which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw this glory in the two men who stood with him. And then it happened, as they were parking from there, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, if it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he had said. See, God cannot pass the prayers of the brokenhearted, hallelujah, and the contrite of spirit. We know that in the book of Psalm chapter 51, he says what's acceptable to him is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We know that the book of Psalms says in chapter 34, verse 18, it says God is near to the brokenhearted and He saves those with a contrite spirit. There is something about a clean hand. There is something about a clean heart and a contrite spirit that God is attracted to. Hallelujah. So what do we need to do? God cannot pass the prayers of these things. So let's create a comfort zone for God to come and habitate Himself. And a discomfort zone for man that is a sinful creature. Hallelujah. But by repentant worship, we will come in our gatherings and we will be repentant in our worship. Drawing God's presence to come and change the atmospheres through our broken hearts and our contrite spirits. Hallelujah. Where is those repented worships? Where is the time for the church to embrace the old rugged cross of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? The blood that carries power. The gospel that's demonstrated in power. It is time for us to see those things manifested more in our lives. Our hunger must propel us beyond the death of the flesh and into the life and the light of God's glory. Hallelujah. For it is the destiny of the church. Salvation is a free gift. But God's glory, it will cost you everything. Hallelujah. Who's prepared to pay that price? Who's prepared to pay that price to be taken on the day of the rapture? To be taken and go and spend eternity in 
heaven. Hallelujah. He wants us to be saturated with His presence and glory. That we can carry His presence within us everywhere we go in this life. This patriarch was one that we can look unto, that we can say, if Moses was persistent, if Moses pursued God, so should we pursue God in our lives like ever before. Hallelujah. We need revival. Church, it's never about numbers, but it's about the state of our hearts. It's about the state of our hands. Have we lifted up an idol to another, as the Bible tells us? Have we lifted up an idol to someone else? God is saying He's coming for those with a clean heart, with pure hands, with a contrite spirit. Let us continue to pursue God. Let us continue to pursue His presence like never before. Like never before, at whatever cost it's going to take. Because I believe that day of revival is going to come. If we are hungry and if we are desperate, if I saw revival broke out within a short period of time within the Catholic Church in Kenya so many years ago, when I there ministered that message, so can we see that take place anywhere else in the world. Hallelujah. It must take place. It must take place. But have we got those broken hearts? Have we got those pure hearts? Have we got those clean hands that God can bring a change in our lives? Hallelujah. So whatever you're facing today, we need revival. We don't need another man of God. We don't need another seminar. We don't need another conference. All we need is a group of people that will come to God in brokenness. That will come to God with a pure and clean and contract spirit. And I believe that God can start with us. Hallelujah. He can start with you there. He can start with you wherever you are. Even if it's you on your own crying out to God. God can bring a change in your life. He can deliver you from that lifetime bondage today in the name of Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we pray for all those that are suffering, all those that are enduring lifetime bondages, all those that it's hard for them not to come to church with a shopping list because the enemy is doing so much against them. The enemy is driving them and doing lots of things against them. But, Lord, I pray today that you will bring change and deliverance to that person's life. And just as you stepped onto the island of Gondora, where the man that was possessed of 5,000 demons was released, he had an awareness that God was there, and he had to run to the only one he knew, which was Jesus Christ. He never even knew Jesus Christ, but he knew that that was the light. And I pray that the church of God would start to clean the altars, would start to clean the leadership, would start to clean the worship, bringing repentant worship, that God will come down once again, that people will be attracted to come to church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.